when we talk about suicides in our society and one of the hot button issues of our day, uh, mass shootings, when we talk about military veterans and their suicides, when we talk about uh, the highest rates of uh, addiction in the history of the world, all of these social phenomena have a cause. They can be explained. They didn't pop out of uh, nowhere. One of the great contributions that the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense made was to break down what they called the plague. And they had this formulation here, capitalism plus dope equals genocide. The Panthers were formed roughly uh, 55, 60 years ago. And my argument is that this formulation, it's actually Michael uh, Tavel, Tavel who, uh, who put this out there in the form of a, a pamphlet part of the Panthers' popular education programs, but I think we need to revisit this today in order to explain how generational trauma, historical trauma, social trauma, leads to the social phenomena that I had uh, mentioned. <clears throat> Trigger warnings, I mean, for many of us our entire childhoods were uh, triggers, but <clears throat> some things here when we broach these subjects so we can take care of uh, one another and take care of ourselves. So we'll start off uh, looking at some of the, the bullet points from the Panthers uh, popular education campaign around this issue. The basic reason why the plague, that is drug addiction, alcoholism, cannot be stopped by the drug prevention and rehabilitation programs is that these programs with their archaic bourgeois Freudian approach and their unrealistic therapeutic communities do not deal with the causes of the problem. These programs deliberately negate or at best deal flippantly with the socioeconomic origin of drug addiction. These programs sanctimoniously deny the fact that capitalist exploitation and racial oppression are the main contributing factors to drug addiction in regards to black people, all oppressed people. These programs were never intended to, to cure black addicts. They can't even cure the white addicts they were de designed for. So here we have the Panthers setting up this dichotomy between what is reformism or liberalism versus a truly comprehensive revolutionary solution. The image of uh, tossing a few crumbs or charity at a homeless person, at an oppressed person, at a Haiti, at a Palestine, without actually getting up under the institutions and the structures that continue to uh, bleed uh, our people across the world, uh, uh, oppressed people. We can come back to these other two uh, bullet points. <clears throat> the Panthers, of course, are addressing this because that's where they come from, in Oakland, in New York City, in Kansas City, across this country where they set up hundreds and hundreds of not just free breakfast programs, not just uh, popular schools, but also actually conscious uh, rehabs in the South Bronx, in Harlem, across New York City, across uh, the world. The lumpen proletariat, the most cast off layers, as Marx and Engels uh, wrote in 1848, of the working class, those that end up uh, in the world of hustling, in the world of dealing uh, drugs. There's a historical debate. The lumpen proletariat, the hustlers, the sex workers, can they be organized? Marx had a quote that Frantz Fanon disagreed with in terms of more of the lumpen proletariat being swept up into the ranks of the snitches, uh, cannon fodder, or useful prey of the state that could be turned against their own uh, class interest, Frantz Fanon, in The Wretched of the Earth and his other writings, thought that the lumpen proletariat could play a redemptive role in revolution. <clears throat> something I'm overly familiar with, not something I ever uh, chose, but as I've mentioned in previous uh, conversations when we're in our circles, this is something that I uh, was parachuted down uh, on me. We don't have some type of democratic right to choose our parents and our uh, genealogy. Uh, these are things that uh, you know we're born into. So generational trauma, denial, and addiction. And I put that denial front and center 
the metaphor that I've used is that the, uh, the PTSD, the trauma, the, uh, the physical violence, the emotional violence, the being shipped off to Iraq, to a, invading and occupying another country in, in, in combat. And I think arguably the number one cause of trauma in our community, sexual trauma, that's the screwdriver into our soul, into our guts. But then the denial, the denial that we catch from close family members, which is so rampant in our communities, that's the screwdriver being further twisted. And then what is the result? And that's where the uh, addiction comes in. This is a, a book that I put out as me and my son there in 2006 in December during the MTA, the transit workers strike. We were out there on uh, picket lines with them and other organizations. These, um, these fires, if you go through Kensington, North Philadelphia and throughout the Northeast, you'll see these fires that people have to light in, 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 in the streets to, to keep themselves warm at, at night because of the homelessness that they're suffering. So a symbolic image there with Chi Chi, with uh, Ernesto and I, I, this was a piece of cathartic uh, writing that streamed uh, out of me, just looking at different generations and and layers of, of, of my uh, family line and ancestral line. Yeah, I had a great uh, mentor right here uh, at, at John Jay, and it's not past tense, Professor David Brotherton is still doing his thing at the Grad Center and right here at uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And I remember him telling me in roughly 2001, I was working in the Dominican Republic and Haiti on research and he said, you know, it's when we're one step removed from the trauma that we can analyze it, distill it, and then feedback analysis, self-reflection to our class, uh, to our people on the trauma that thankfully we were just enough removed from, in my case, certainly with some things, other things, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a survivor myself, but if we're too immersed in the trauma, we might end up like uh, one of my cousins uh, here um, and so many of my family members where the oppression is so thick, you're not able to uh, articulate. You're so caught up in survival. Um, you end up in the prison industrial complex. You end up in the streets. You end up hustling. You end up uh, overdosing, right? And it's all the trips to the funerals and the wakes Never mind my, 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 my two sons' generation. I've lost track how many uh, young people we've, we've lost at this point. And again, incumbent upon us as students of these macro subjects, we have a responsibility to explain this, to use sociological, anthropological, historical tools to explain this social phenomenon, or we start thinking that we're the losers and we're the, the tecatos, the good for nothings, the junkies, just, just listen to the terminology. Junkie, bum. How many of us have, have employed that term, uh, bum, for a homeless person? So we've internalized the enemy's narrative. We've seen ourselves through the enemy's lens, through a prison, prison that's alien to our, our interests. That's why I think this uh, societal conversation is so important. Uh, one piece that I uh, put out to dig deeper into this, I remember when I first started writing this uh, piece, it was actually in Boulder, Colorado at a, at a wedding in 2009-ish, and I, I just kept asking myself, for, since I was a little kid, how come so many of my family members had been through these traumatizing events? So the, the title there of this piece, To Live Among Broken Men, theorizing rape and, and, and incest. It's a very heavy title, but I always saw it uh, as an organic intellectual, as an intellectual that came from these realities in my family, in my neighborhood, in my uh, city, uh, Brockton and later on the Bronx. Uh, I could never understand because it was never natural to see so many people that you love so dearly have to uh, survive so much of this trauma. <clears throat> little babies 
pure as can be, the purest thing we could ever imagine, like a blank sheet of paper, ready for any imprint to be, um, <clears throat> any, any uh, children, babies are impressionable, right? But they're not born mean-spirited, they're not born, um, well, they could be born addicted, of course, if, if, if the parents went through uh, these types of things. But the point being that we see this innocence, we see this purity. <clears throat> but what happens over the course of years and, 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 and decades where we have such a massive uh, population of homeless people? The most common place for mentally ill people in our society is where? In the prison industrial complex in, 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 on Rikers Island. Mentally ill people don't receive the actual resources uh, that they deserve. That's how they end up on, on, on the street. So capitalism is a myth-making machine that never seeks to explain. So here's this, this disconnect. And we want to fill in those, those blanks. So here we have the Paolo Freire uh, uh, concept that none of us are, are thugs or any of these other many words I don't even want to uh, 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 repeat. And Paolo Freire, to paraphrase, said, you are not uh, a, a tecato, you are not a junkie, you are not these super misogynistic terms. You're oppressed, you're a warrior, you know, you're a fighter. And, and, and that's the lens that the Panthers provided because otherwise you end up pointing the finger at yourself and at your family members and at your uh, community. Gabor Mate, I think one of the great social psychologists of our age, uh, all of his uh, uh, work should certainly be embraced and studied. We readily feel for the suffering child, but cannot see the child in the adult who his soul fragmented and isolated hustles for survival a few blocks away from where we shop or work. Just a teaser, anything by Gabor Mate, a frequent guest on Democracy Now. Pick it up. <clears throat> Some of these numbers are uh, slightly outdated, but still uh, completely telling. Um, in those 19 years, from 99 to 2018, almost a million drug overdoses. I would almost double or triple that number because so many heart attacks or strokes could, could, could be misdiagnoses, and it was actually because of the uh, opioid epidemic. Um, these numbers have, have risen, certainly with the arrival of the uh, pandemic. Leading causes of injury-related deaths in the United States. And the number one killer are these opioids. And nowadays, the media war spearheaded by Tucker Carlson and Fox News, backward through and through, racist through and through, anti-Chinese and xenophobic, they always want to uh, blame it on the Mexicans and the cartels, there's even rumors and threats from Trump that if Trump's elected president next year, that he would invade uh, Mexico. <clears throat> and of course, the China bashing never ends. <clears throat> and they never turn around to reflect on what really triggered this modern day opioid crisis. The painkillers, the oxycodone, the Percocet, the Viking, and they weren't coming from China, they weren't coming from Mexico, they were coming from uh, our own psychiatrists and, 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 and doctors. I remember in my 20s, certainly as I went through different mental health crises, I only had to call any of these psychiatrists and it was just pill after pill, benzos, opioids, Skittles across the, 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 the board. So this propaganda campaign this war on China, this war on Mexico, these are informational and ideological wars in the superstructure of, of society, but the Chinese are not responsible for all of the trauma, from all of the social alienation. And, and we gotta peel back all the social layers that begin to explain at, at this point in 2023, we've already had upward towards 200 uh, mass shootings in this society. How do we understand again that social phenomena. We have to be on the front lines of explaining these things. Otherwise, it's gonna be explained away and mis-explained by our uh, class enemies. 
There's so many myths in terms of who we are as human beings. Every day we hear that human beings are naturally avaricious and, and, and selfish, but I think quite the uh, contrary. I think that we can be molded just as easily into collective human beings. I am my brother's keeper, I am my sister's keeper. We can look out for one another. <clears throat> I think if you go back to, there's this great book called 1491, the year before the original genocidaire Columbus, the original Taurus, the original rapist, the original uh, traffickers and kidnappers of abducted Africans before they brought this colonial project to these shores, these shores of Turtle uh, Island, as, as it was called, <clears throat> by some of the indigenous nations, we had different ways of life. We had primitive communism. We had communalism. We had native peoples uh, from Patagonia up into what is today Alaska who had their own uh, ways of life. And it was not predicated on private property. It was not predicated on uh, a rat race. These are all things that are introduced over the course of time, specifically in the last uh, five centuries. So that date, 1492, is, is symbolic in that sense. How many times have we been told that we're naturally selfish, that men are naturally dogs and pigs, Again, these are all myths that we have to um, combat. And if you look at different anthropological studies, it will prove this and uh, much more. This is a, a, a beautiful image to me. This is where I studied uh, once upon a time as a scholarship student, later on a fellowship student at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. And going back to how they inculcate us how they socialize us with, with, with certain ideas. If you can read the names up here, Herodotus and Sophocles and Plato and Aristotle, Columbia, the Ivy League, what is the Ivy League? The Ivy League is uh, nothing more than a place for the ultra rich to network and continue to lay claim uh, to the ownership of the central economic pores of our society on graduation day a group of courageous uh, students went up into Lowell Library and they put up Maya Angelou's name and, and, and Gloria Anzaldua and, and all these Zora Neale Hurston and all Toni Morrison and all these different scholars and writers and poets and authors who, who weren't represented in what they called the core curriculum when I was back during undergrad. So a very symbolic act uh, during graduation at, at Columbia, we had a whole campaign, a whole student movement, because they just wanted to feed us, especially in the realm of international relations. When I did my graduate work, we only ever got to read the capitalist philosophers and the imperialist and white supremacist philosophers who posited these very ideas that international relations were by definition uh, uh, violent, and, and, and competitive, so we wanted to interject another worldview, the worldview of collectivity, the worldview of socialism, the worldview of, uh, of, of harmony and, 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 and peace. In anti-imperialism, we always have to come back to that central idea by Karl Marx that in every epic, the ruling ideas of every epic are the ideas of the ruling class. And from the time you wake up in the morning and your alarm clock goes off to the time that you uh, fall asleep at night. I read one study years ago that you're subjected to over 5,000 direct advertisement uh, from capitalism, from billboards, from the, the two train, from the MTA, from um, of course social media nowadays, and it could be more. When you turn on Hut 97 and the radio, so. They've programmed us in very, very specific ways to walk through the world like this. That's why I think it's important to take uh, these courses in the Latin American Studies Department and the African American Studies Department that pushes back on this entire uh, Western pro-imperialist narrative. Important uh, books out there that cover what trauma actually does to our nervous system, which, which, which runs through the, the, the gut. If you've been through trauma, 
uh, it can miswire your entire system. That can be manifested in cold sweats, nightmares, um, uh, flashbacks, uh, uh, shaky leg. Uh, all these different things are, are, are the symptoms of, of, of trauma, um, lack of, 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 of trust. And going back to uh, Matulu Shakur, uh, recently released from prison after how many decades in a, a U.S. dungeon, uh, only because he dreamed of and, and organized and fought for, lived for, um, the liberation of, of, of his people and of all oppressed people. But the Panthers were able to bring these super conscious detox programs into our, our communities. I contrasted here, I'm a 12-stepper my, myself coming out of the 12-step uh, programs. And 12-step programs are a lifeline for so many human beings, but I think the Panthers elevated it to the next level because they injected a, a sense of self and self-identity and self-worth and self-love into their survival programs. In this case, the survival programs were detox programs, programs to get our, our, our people off of uh, heroin and, 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 and crack and other the other uh, poison. Malcolm X has that famous quote, the Dead Prez samples where, they where he talks about all of the wine and heroin and everything in, our, in, in these streets is nothing but poison. And it's not a conspiracy theory to say that directly and indirectly, this has been used to control us, uh, to divide us uh, against one another and against our, ourselves. When you're an addict, your emotional development, your intellectual development is stunted. So uh, people very close to me who picked up drugs when they were 11, when they were 12, and maybe they didn't get clean until their 40s, they missed entire decades. In a sense, they're still in a type of childhood uh, trance because they never developed the necessary coping mechanisms. And to quote Bertolt Brecht, if they're still alive today, that's a miracle unto itself. Our, our, our survival in this society, dead set against our interests, our spiritual interests, our class interests, our very survival could be considered a, a, a miracle. More scholarship on, on this topic, another great book, this is uh, a, a Dutch scholar, uh, Basil van der Kock. And the, the title, I think, says it all. The body keeps the score, brain, mind, and body in the healing of trauma. And the capitalist view of pull yourself up by the bootstraps and just be strong and forget about the past is ridiculous. It's alien to our interests. If we can't sit with the pain, how can we reimagine the future? We're doomed to repeat it if we don't confront it. So this doctor here, uh, goes to great lengths to show scientifically how the brain, the body, how we hold this trauma. That's why you hear so much in trauma release workshops and yoga workshops and all the type of work that we do uh, towards healing on an individual level, but also on the societal level, the importance of the breathing, of the meditation, of a spiritual prayer, of whatever works for you. Um, one statistic here, I mean, I've seen it so much higher. Uh, one in five children in America sexually molested. That's an official statistic. I would put it at, at twice that because how many of us internalize that is our fault, the shame, especially us as, well, I can't really say, especially as young men. I mean, young women, uh, if we catch hell, young, young women are catching twice as much hell. But the work that I did with the left in the Dominican Republic and in Haiti and Mexico and El Salvador and Guatemala and all the neo colonies of the global south. I remember telling comrades, you know, when you look at the rates of sexual predation in a village, in a barrio, it corresponds directly to the intensity of the oppression in those communities. That's one indicator. And not surprisingly, where are the largest rates of suicide, the largest rates of uh, sexual abuse, the largest rates of addiction, of overdoses? Where do they happen in the divided snakes of America? In poor white communities, but even more so in indigenous communities, 
and first world nations in, in, in the black community. That's what oppression is. That's what super oppression is. But we hear the diametrical opposite where it's the victim that's blamed, where the survivor is blamed. So that's really the uh, raison d'etre behind this, this lecture. The need to escape, I think it's fairly uh, obvious. Um, a quote here from Gabor Mate in the realm of hungry ghosts, close encounters with addiction. A necessary reading, I'll at least uh, read a piece of it. The greatest damage done by neglect, trauma, or emotional loss is not the immediate pain they inflict, but the long-term distortions they induce in the way a developing child will continue to interpret the world in her or his situation in it. So there's a certain baseline in terms of uh, opening up. There's a certain baseline in terms of sexual expression. There's a certain baseline in terms of sleep and stress and, 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 and our relationship to nourishment and food, right? That's the baseline. But what happens when that's all offset and upset by um, traumatizing events linked to the society we live in and, and this is generational and it's reciprocated and we don't heal and then we perpetuate it on to our own people, the people we, we, we love the most, because most of this abuse, it comes from within the, the family. It's not always strangers who are doing it. That baseline, we become outliers, insomnia, depression, we sleep too much, um, obesity, What's the, pole, what's the quote unquote opposite of obesity, the anorexia, the eating disorders, but that's actually just a reflection of the same, uh, the same pain. That baseline again has been completely overturned. Another book to uh, highlight, it didn't start with you. Again, just in the title, you begin to, to have a new approach to these uh, topics. Carrying the historical trauma, I mean, one exercise for me in my younger years, I made an actual genealogy. So I went through my father's family, my mother's family, and the tatara abuelos, and you trace it back different generations, and then highlight who is an alcoholic, highlight who is abusive, highlight, and, and, and you see this repeated through the generations. So the rhetorical question for us to take home, how can we interrupt? Um, you know, I, I, I want to pass on to my children. Um, I remember posting one time that the trauma would stop with, uh, with my grandchildren, with my, my, my son's children. Ah, a deeper point, maybe I can reflect on uh, at a different point. Subtitle, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle. Another worthy read. Another book here by Dr. Gabor Mate. Um, the mind and the body cannot be uh, separated. When the body says no, the hidden cost of stress, want the silent killer, you know. Uh, off topic some, when we think about the everyday causes of stress, being overworked, being broke, but what I wanna focus on is our bodies carry an inordinate amount of, of stress and often subconsciously or semi-consciously. So when someone mysteriously has a stroke at 51, when someone is mysteriously diagnosed with skin cancer at, at, at 49, like these are just different family members that are, that are coming up randomly for me, again, there's an explanation. There's a scientific explanation. The truth is always concrete as the Hegelian dialectic uh, lays out. So here we have uh, another explanation to explain uh, all of the pain that we uh, go through. We live in a society, no society in human history has ever um, prescribed uh, so many pills. No society has ever taken so many chemicals in order to sleep, and then in order to get up, in order to not feel stress, in order to feel emotions, in order to feel energy. So the super over uh, medication of our society is actually a documentary by a, a similar title. So when we do those anthropological studies, if you look at um, different societies that haven't been so heavily influenced by the West, 
You're not gonna hear children labeled hyperactive, attention deficit disorder, autistic. Um, they didn't have these problems. If you go back a generation, two, three, we didn't have, we, no, they, were, they weren't school shooters a generation or two ago. I mean, Bowling for Columbine and that documentary by uh, Michael Moore, that, 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 that began to be the, uh, the beginning of an analysis of this, this late capitalist, decadent, uh, pseudo-fascist society that we call America today, the freest, most democratic society in the world, right? Yeah, I'm a real student of Gabor Monte. I think this is the fourth uh, book that I uh, cite by him, Scattered. This is an alternative sociological explanation of why somebody would have ADHD. And Gabor Monte himself very self-reflectively talks about being a survivor of the Holocaust in Hungary. And of course, he says uh, every uh, Jewish baby and every Jewish family suffered from some type of uh, tension, hypertension, mental illness, uh, hyperactivity. How could you not be? Um, I actually just returned from Saxon housing concentration camp outside of Berlin and um, in Dachau outside of, um, of, of, of München, uh, Munich. And um, another historic example of a people um, entirely scapegoated I think we all, uh, all international uh, working class, sons and daughters of the international working class have a sacred duty to go to Auschwitz and Treblinka and, and, um, and learn and study about the revolutionary Yiddish land and, 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 and the historical Jewish uh, resistance to the Nazi projects. And, that resistance today takes on different forms. Um, Anti-Zionism, solidarity with the Palestinians, uh, Jewish voices for, for peace. <clears throat> so much to read up on. <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Joy uh, DeGroy, uh, an important book. And if we look at the uh, Black American historical odyssey, there's an important question to ask. I mean, 1865, the Civil War, Supposedly slavery ends, in big quotation marks, and then there's black reconstruction, but then you have the, uh, you know, the historic compromise and, and, and the great sellout of 1877 where the North abandons the South and the old slave masters are back in the driver's seat of, 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 of Southern history. I don't think we could identify any moment where for black America, the trauma ends. Um, go back through Jim Crow segregation and lynching and, and the police murders and the police state terrorism today. Is there any moment since the first Africans are enchained and brought here against their will that black America hasn't been subjected to this level of, 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 of trauma? That's what this book here begins to uh, explain. Certainly that's what we fight for. We fight for reparations. We fight for, and we, and we stand in solidarity with the black nation that seeks uh, self-determining institutions, schools that, treat, that, that, that teach the truth about black history, um, banks that aren't predatory, people's banks, like, like what they're setting up right now in uh, Shanghai with Lula and Jilma Rousseff's uh, visits over there, stuff that we've mentioned in previous classes. Um, whenever we talk about the yin, we got to talk about the yang. Whenever we talk about capitalism, we have to talk about a future for our young people. And here we have a group of uh, Cuban school children with their beautiful, a different red, white, and blue, but uh, beautiful uniforms. And I would make a historical argument that the Cubans, yes, they have actively sought to interrupt the historical trauma they were subjected to prior to 1959 because the working class and the peasantry and the toiling classes, the most oppressed, are elevated. They elevate themselves through this social, economic, far-reaching revolution, which was not overnight on January 1st, 1959. It took years and years with the leadership of Camilo Cienfuegos and Aide Santa Maria and Celia Sanchez and, of course, Fidel Castro, David Verse. Goliath, the U.S.'s uh, <laughs> number one 
enemy. And what the Cubans were able to do were collectively draft strategies of how to combat the misogyny and the machismo and the sexual violence. That's why they put a blockade on Cuba so we can't learn anything about Cuba. That's why they starve Venezuela in attempt to, some statistics say that 40,000 uh, Venezuelans roughly every year have been killed by the Obama 2014 sanctions. That's why everyone should check out The War on Cuba by Belly of the Beast on YouTube. That's why there's active US wars against uh, these different countries who have dared to stand up for their own interests. The duty of revolutionary optimism, that's why it's our duty Break the blockade, not just the travel blockade, the economic blockade and the mental blockade. Free yourself from mental slavery in the spirit of, of Bob Marley when we can go and see Syria with our own eyes and Vietnam and China and these, these, these different experiments. And no one's trying to say that any of those societies are perfect, but to take that step towards throwing off the shackles of imperialism is indeed a perfect step as we say in recovery. I don't know anything about tomorrow. I don't know anything about 20 years. The world record for sobriety is 24 hours. The best I can do right now is take the next right step. Uh, and Malcolm talks about that. Education is the passport to the future for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. So I hope that this conversation begins to enlighten and oppose the dominant narrative around addiction. And um, we'll, we'll end with that revolution.